Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Utah. Madam President, on February 19th, 1942, and that'll be 80 years ago this coming Saturday, President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, authorizing the blatantly racist mass incarceration of essentially all Japanese Americans inside the United States at the time. Uh, this was an indefensible move, one that resulted in locking up about 120,000 decent, hardworking, innocent people based on nothing other than their race. Two years later, in one of the most shameful moments in America's judicial history, the U.S. Supreme Court deferred to the Roosevelt administration's blatantly racist and equally unconstitutional imprisonment of Japanese Americans. Writing for the majority in a case called Korematsu versus United States, Associate Justice Hugo Black, a justice with a history of bigotry, unconscionably glossed over the countless constitutional violations built into the race-based internment of innocent American citizens, who the court acknowledged quote, were loyal to this country, overwhelmingly, based on the fact that, quote, there was evidence of disloyalty on the part of some Japanese Americans, and military authorities considered that the need for action was great. In a moment, one might expect uh, from someone like Justice Black, who had a, a history of bigotry, he cavalierly dismissed the blatant racism inherent in this action, reasoning that, quote, to cast this case into outlines of racial prejudice without reference to the real military dangers which were presented merely confuses the issue. Tragically, Justice Black, blinded perhaps by his own intoler intolerance and bigotry or perhaps by his loyalty to the president who had appointed him just a few years earlier, missed the obvious point. Racial prejudice was the issue. That was the whole point. I agree with the characterization later provided by now Chief Justice Roberts just a few years ago in 2018 when he noted that, quote, Korematsu was gravely wrong the, the day it was decided and has been overruled in the court of history and, to be clear, has no place in the law under the Constitution, close quote. No person should ever be in prison solely due to their race shouldn't be even a factor in anyone's imprisonment, certainly not in the United States of America. Japanese internment is one of the very worst examples, one of the very worst examples of our government rejecting its founding principles. It's something that should be rem remembered so that it can never be repeated. Despite this mistreatment by government, Japanese Americans served faithfully in, in many capacities during World War II and have continued to serve our nation and their communities in irreplaceable ways. Their contributions are, are worth remembrance and celebration. Regrettably, the United States has failed to meet other, admittedly far less fundamental, obligations that it's made to individuals and to states. One of those obligations is relevant here, ironically uh, arising in the context of an effort to honor victims of FDR's internment of Japanese Americans. The federal government has neglected commitments made by Congress to Western states at the time of their admission to dispose of large swaths of federal land. Similar promises have been made to most states that were admitted into the Union ever since the Louisiana Purchase, but for the fact that Congress honored such promises with respect to a lot of these states, including states like Illinois and Missouri, the federal government would still, to this day, own around 90% of those states. And the same can be said of many, many others. Although Utah received such assurances from Congress prior to its admission into the Union in 1896, using essentially identical language, Utah is still waiting for the federal government to honor its end of the bargain. However, unlike states like Illinois and Missouri, which received the benefit of the federal bargain, Utah did not. The federal government still owns more than two-thirds 
of all the land in my state, resulting in an extraordinary amount of environmental, economic, and educational consequences that hurt Utahns, particularly those Utahns in poor and rural communities. In fact, in a blatant insult to the people whose families settled and developed much of the rural West and their communities, the federal government continues to limit and restrict access, commerce, mining, drilling, and grazing on land it had promised to relinquish. Rural farms, industries, and communities are shrinking and dying because of this continually broken promise. To add insult to injury, the feds routinely fail to care properly for the land in their portfolio. The maintenance backlog in the national park system is years long and $12 billion in the hole. The Bureau of Land Management controls vast swaths of the western United States. It controls them from Washington, D.C., with little interest or regard for the people whose livelihoods and way of life depend on that land. This relationship remains a vexing problem for everyday life in Utah. Businesses are shuttered because the federal government capriciously halt, halts mineral extraction authority. Ranches go bankrupt because the Bureau of Land Management ends grazing rights in areas where families have raised cattle for generations. And then just last week, federal land managers damaged an exquisite collection of dinosaur fossils and would have continued doing so but for the intervention of a noble citizen named Jeremy Roberts who was willing to call them out on it. At a time when the federal government already owns far more land than it can manage, Congress should be really cautious about decreasing federal land holdings. It should be going out of its way to decrease its federal land holdings and doing that rather than increasing them. Recognition of sites like the Amache Camp deserve better than federal management. However, if those representing the state of Colorado think the federal government can do better, or for whatever reason just want it to be under the national parks jurisdiction rather than subject to local control, then I'm not inclined to argue with them. I, what I w would like to ask is that this land uh, not continue to be acquired by the federal government with no plan in sight for dealing with the size of the federal footprint. It's the, the, the size of the overall federal land estate that worries me because the federal government has not proven a good steward of what it's got. So if we keep adding to that, it's only going to perpetuate some of these problems. Now, I've been wrongfully portrayed by some in the media as being somehow against this historical recognition and against commemorating as a warning to future generations and to honor the victims of the past, uh, one of this nation's uh, and its government's most tragic missteps. I continue to negotiate in good faith to find a way forward with this bill. Now, I've been in communication with the lead sponsor of the House, and I, 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 I think there are ways that we can address this uh, uh, to address both, uh, both goals at issue. I, I think we need to be able to commemorate these events, and we also need to do so in a way it won't lead to the unfettered expansion of the federal land footprint. And so, Madam President, I, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of calendar number 255, H.R. 2497. I further ask that the Lee Amendment at the desk be considered and agreed to, that the committee reported amendments be agreed to, that the bill as amended be considered, read a third time, and passed, and that the motions to reconsider be considered, made, and laid upon the table. Is there an objection? Madam President. Senator from Colorado. Madam President, re reserving the right to object, um, uh, I strongly disagree with Senator Lee's uh, proposal amending the, um, the uh, what has been agreed to, not agreed to, but what has gotten every single member of the Senate. But for one, I want to also say, uh, Madam President, that I was on the floor about 10 days ago, I think, on the subject of this, and I, I want through the chair for the Senator of Utah to know, I didn't even mention who had, had, who had objected while, while I was here, but it was one out of 100 senators. This bill passed the House of Representatives with all but two votes. It passed with every single vote 
from the Colorado delegation, and we have, we have the gamut of people, you know, in from Colorado. The bill is strongly supported by uh, my friend Ken Buck, who I ran against in 2010. And if Ken were here, he'd say there's very little upon which we agree. I hope there's more than he thinks we agree on, but we definitely agree on this. And so, let me just explain, Madam President, why we wrote this bill. In five days, as the Senator from Utah has said, we're going to mark the 80th anniversary of Executive Order 9066, which began the forced dispossession and internment of over 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. Two-thirds of them were citizens of this country, American citizens forced out of their homes into camps by our own government, by their own government. One of those camps was a match in the Eastern Plains, on the Eastern Plains of Colorado, where the federal government detained nearly 10,000 Japanese Americans against their will. Most of them had less than a week. Madam President, most of them had less than a week to get rid of virtually everything they own and crowd onto buses and trains with no idea where they were going or what was going to happen to them. Some of the first arrivals at Amachi were kids younger than the pages that are on the floor here today with us who were forced to build the camp where their own families were interred during the duration of the war. The conditions were horrible. The walls didn't always reach the ceilings. The windows weren't always sealed. It meant that snow blew in during the winter, dust blew in during the summer. This is what our government did to our fellow Americans, to children forced to work in the fields to grow their own food in the jail that the United States of America had committed them to. And what's even more remarkable is that despite this treatment, one out of 10 of the people at Amachi still volunteered to serve during the war, a higher rate than any other camp in America. Think about that. They were willing to defend the very government that was detaining them, that had locked up their children. That's how much they believed in America, even when America turned our back on them. And I had the opportunity to visit Amachi a few years ago with John Hopper, a high school prisoner, uh, a high school pr uh, principal in Grenada who worked with his students to create the Amachi Preservation Society. They've been taking care of this site themselves all of these years, collecting items from all over the world that former prisoners have sent back because they want people to remember. They want a memorial to their captivity. And year after year, these High school students and their teacher have worked to restore the site so that the next generation of Coloradans could learn about what happened there. If we're up to me, Madam President, every student in Colorado and throughout the American West would go there throughout our entire country and learn about the Americans of Amachi, the men and women who were held onto hope year after year, who supported one another who forged a community behind the barbed wires of this site, who never gave up on the United States of America, even as it was interning them on their own soil. And after I visited the site, I introduced a bill with Senator Hickenlooper to make Amachi part of the national park system so that it would have the resources and recognition it deserves for years to come. We have to get this done, Madam President, because the survivors of Amachi are growing fewer and fewer in number each year. We have to keep the memory of what they went through alive for the next generation. That's what Colorado wants, Madam President. I have a list of over 70 groups that support it, from the Asian Chamber of Commerce to the Colorado Council of Churches to the town of Grenada. Who owns the site today? So, Madam President, I ask unanimous consent to enter this list into the record. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. This bill wasn't controversial in Colorado, and it wasn't controversial in the House, where Republican Congressman Ken Buck, whose district this is, took up the bill with Joe Neguse, a neighboring congressman. 
Amachi's and Ken's district in Prowers County. And I said that the bill, the, the bill passed the House 416, I think it was, to two. And it wasn't controversial in the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, where it passed with bipartisan support from the chairman and ranking member. And that's why I came here two weeks ago to pass the bill by unanimous consent. consent. But now there's, there's been an objection. And I should mention, by the way, that this site is less than one square mile. It is a tiny, tiny fraction of even the county that we're in. And it seems to me that we shouldn't, if we believe in federalism at all, we shouldn't be blocking Colorado's right to preserve less than one square mile the way we see fit. That we shouldn't have to reduce the public lands of the United States by an equal amount, and I'll say, in that connection, Madam President, that I formally object to the to the senator from Utah's um, uh, uh, motion for this reason. The land here is owned by Grenada. It's already public land. The town has said it wants to donate it to the National Park Service. I have a letter from the town making this intention perfectly clear. So it's not even private land that's being becoming public. It's public land transitioning from a local government to the federal government at the request of the community. And they're not asking for anything in return. And I think that's an important point that the, that the senator from Utah has raised. And we've worked with the, the, the town to, to show that they're not asking for an exchange. They want to donate the land as their patriotic contribution to America to protect this part of our history. And I, I would think all of us here should agree that Unless it's hurting somebody else, a town can do whatever it likes with its own land, just like a private landowner can do with their own land. I also, let me stop there, Madam President, and see whether the Senator from Utah has any reaction to that. I, I will formally object to his motion, and, and I'll stop there. And I've got other things to say, but I. I hope that maybe we can get to an agreement based on what I would offer. So I object. Objection is heard. Madam President. Senator from Utah. Yeah, a couple of points. I, I, I don't think we're, we're far off in, in where we are on this. Um, it, is, um, it is true that um, it's not uh, an expanse of land that is as big as some other land transfers we see, one square mile. On the one hand, uh, a lot of people would regard that as, as large, 640 acres, uh, the acreage equivalent of one square mile. I would note here that this isn't, uh, I wouldn't call it an, a federalism argument that we have to allow this. There are federal implications to this that extend far beyond what uh, a, a local unit of government might, might want to do. Because what happens is when you transfer it into the federal estate, we do incur additional obligations uh, to make sure that that land is maintained and managed appropriately, it does cost money. And it, it takes an expense off the books of those who would otherwise be maintaining it. So it's, it's not without any consequence at all, and, nor is it a matter of simple uh, uh, operation of federalism to say that we should allow this in, in this circumstance. I would note, moreover, that um, we've come closer on this. The amendment that I offered a moment ago that my friend and colleague, uh, the senator from, uh, from Colorado, objected to, is one that would allow this to happen, uh, but would require an offset to be made by the appropriate federal land managers within one year of the transfer of this land. There's nothing about that that strikes me as particularly unobjectionable, particularly given the fact that the federal government owns and manages about 30 percent of the land mass in the United States, in, in my state and in Colorado. It's much more than that, but um, uh, there's nothing about that that should be particularly objectionable. That said, the senator from Colorado has, has changed this legislation in a meaningful way. And because I've got a desire to honor those victims of uh, this horrific event in American history, and the senator from Colorado has offered up a separate solution uh, one that would involve donation rather than acquisition by the federal government. And although that also raises some concerns in that over time, 
think we've got to watch this because the more we enhance the federal land footprint, the more difficult it will be for the federal government to keep up with the maintenance backlog. But given that this doesn't directly impact uh, uh, concerns quite the way uh, uh, the, those same concerns might be implicated if we were having to purchase it at the outset, um, I'd be inclined if, if my friend from Colorado were interested in offering that amendment um, uh, uh, to withhold any objection from that while noting that it's, it's my hope and expectation that moving forward we can be more aware of these issues and that as we see the federal land footprint increasing, we can take steps as a body to make sure that uh, uh, there's some natural stopping point uh, e e even before we turn to what I, I, I believe we still have got to turn to, which is the commitment made at statehood uh, that still needs to be honored. Madam President. Senator from Colorado. I thank, the, I thank uh, through the chair of the, through, uh, the, um, through the president, um, the senator from Utah. And I think, um, let me start, Madam President, by saying that I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of calendar 255 HR 2497. Further, I ask the Bennett Amendment at the desk be considered and agreed to. The committee reported amendments be agreed to. The bill as amended be considered, read a third time, and passed, and that the motions to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table. Is there objection? Madam President? Senator from Colorado. We're, this is all happening on the fly right now, so I'm actually going to withdraw that in the spirit of, of, of Senate, what has, Senator Lee has said. Hopefully we can do this later today. We need to make sure that everybody has the benefit of seeing the language, and then we'll be back later to do this. So I thank the Senator from Utah, and I will spare him the rest of my speech, except I think he deserves to hear this, and I think everybody here deserves to hear this, which is when the ENR committee took up took this legislation up this fall. Here's what the survivors from Amachi wrote to the committee, and I just want to put their words into the record before I withdraw. During World War II, this is their, their, their words. During World War II, we were forced to live as prisoners in our own country. Along with our parents, we were forced from our homes, tagged like animals, and sent to the desolate prairie of southeast Colorado, where we lived in trauma a constant presence of armed guards, barbed wire, and suffering too large to describe in one correspondence. Our families suffered loss of jobs, homes, property, and businesses, and many of us lost family members. Many of our parents went to their graves without even an apology from their country. Our nation still has a long way to go to learn from this mistake, and our community, both old and young, continues to suffer from anti-Asian hate crimes increasing to this day. Our national parks and the stories they honor reflect our values as a nation. Adding Amachi to the national park system would allow us to protect a unique story that has largely been forgotten and can only be told through the power of place. With each year that passes, there are fewer of us. We are counting on you to see us through, and because of the discussion we've had tonight, we're going to have the chance later to be able to do that. I thank my friend from Utah, and I thank the presiding officer. I yield the floor.